Okay. Hello. Good morning, everyone. Now we have a, our second presentation by Marcus Neteller from Mundialis, who is going to explain us how they have moved the grass to the cloud. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Um, I want to report also um, about something which was already started uh, in 2017. And as you can see from the title, how digging into the earth for the fiber, uh, so fiber optic cable, we are talking about rollout to grass to the cloud. This to grass to the cloud already indicates that uh, we are talking about uh, something which lasted for a while. And uh, today I report on uh, what has been done so far. Uh, the co-authors are uh, from Mundialis mainly, and Thorsten Drei, he's from German Telekom, also sitting there. And uh, yeah, so what are we talking about? Fiber to the home, FTTH, is something which is pretty important, as you can imagine, because everybody wants to have fast internet, and the fast internet is not yet everywhere. So when we talk about fast internet here, that is like one gigabit per second. And in many parts of the world, it is not like that. And you can see the, uh, the ranking of Germany among European countries. Uh, let's say there's some roof, room for improvement. And um, on the positive side, it is driving the development what I can report about today. And this is something which uh, is, of course, uh, very nice. Because if things are already done, uh, well, then you have to find a different topic. So the idea is about uh, transferring uh, data about uh, optical cables that is extremely fast. Uh, and that's why everybody wants that. And there are different ways of doing so. Uh, this talk here is in a context of a number of talks. Yesterday, we had one by, presented by Carmen Tavalika uh, about GrassJS in the cloud Actinia geoprocessing. This is the new REST API around Grass, which I will also briefly show here. You can see the talk in streaming, let's say, from the archive. It's already there. Yesterday, we had as well from, uh, presented by Emmanuel Bello, sitting over there, uh, a talk about SDI. And um, that is to, what is the date today? Today, uh, we have also the other talk by Thorsten Rai about uh, POTS, so again about uh, how to bring fiber optics planning into the cloud. That is one part. So cable uh, and where the where question, where to put the cable, is basically the main question. You can imagine that digging into the earth is quite an effort, and it's also uh, expensive. It depends on the surface you have, uh, how much effort it is. Here, you, here we see something probably in, um, do I have a pointer? Maybe it was asphalt or something, just this green doesn't matter, but you can imagine that putting the cable is some effort. So now if you want to have like 10,000 kilometers of fiber optics cable, uh, then it becomes really interesting. And uh, that's why we got um, into this project of, uh, for the German telecom uh, of uh, optimizing the, the, let's say, the identification of potential trenches. So uh, there are different data sources. Just briefly, what uh, is uh, being used here. Here you see something like a uh, streetcar. So this comes with a lot of sensors here. There are cameras. There are laser scanners. They are scanning everything. You can see here the houses and so forth. And this is quite some uh, huge amount of data, uh, which is used in this entire process here. But the problem is, Behind the houses, you cannot uh, see anything because the car is driving on the street. It can look left, right, back and forth, but that's it. And uh, so we had to overcome this problem by some different approach. And not surprisingly, aerial photography is relevant here and laser scanning if available. Or photogrammetric point clouds, they are also sometimes available, but often they are derived from stereo uh, imagery. They are often of a lower resolution. And then what we want to get is something like a, a surface map telling you what is there, meter by meter. And if you eventually assign cost of uh, digging, yeah, uh, maybe in asphalt, in green space, and whatever it is, then you can come up with some uh, cost surface. And from that, you can determine 
where to put the cables and where not. And of course, there are tons of rules. You cannot put them anywhere you think, but uh, you have to respect private ground. You have to have minimal distances here and there. And so there are a lot of, uh, of different rules. And eventually, we use cadastral data as available. They're not always super precise in Germany. It depends on, on where you are. At least for this purpose, uh, we fall, fell back to this approach in order to uh, improve those data sets. So question is how to get from input data to potential trenches. <clears throat> As mentioned, I'm focusing on this. So let's say I'm focusing on this part here in the center. Uh, aerial imagery and data derived from LiDAR point clouds. Um, we developed recently a method to uh, automatically identify training areas. So those of you who are, who are familiar with um, uh, image classification, supervised image classification, know you, do you then go and have to digitize, okay, this is a ideal green space and this is a forest and this is uh, something else. But uh, if you now want to work on in a cloud infrastructure and on hundreds of uh, areas in parallel, then you have to do that automatically. So kind of identification of areas which are statistically ideal for the classification you want to obtain. So the classification doesn't exist. We have a classification here which is focused on finding optimal trenches. Okay, then it goes to supervised classification. As already mentioned, we use machine learning here. Uh, we turn then the surfaces into cost surfaces and then we can do the classical routing on the cost surface in order to find the optimal trenches. This is then uh, input to some other software which is eventually uh, checking the accesses house by house, but that's not our business. So, um, data you are quite familiar with, optical uh, autophotos here, digital autophotos with four channels, also with infrared and we are in the lucky situation. This is the federal state of, uh, of North Rhine-Westphalia in Germany. So somewhere here is uh, Cologne. So this is Cologne, for example, Bonn. We are living here and some, the Ruhrgebiet is somewhere there. And we have all data available as open data since beginning of um, uh, uh, 2017. And you see the resolution 10 centimeter. This is near the Cologne Dome, which is actually here. Uh, that is quite exciting. And we also have the point clouds available and that's then eventually a good input in order to determine the surface structure. Okay, so this again the dome of Cologne, the Rhine, River Rhine and so on. The tools are those uh, which we use, PDAL, uh, very useful for point cloud uh, analysis, uh, Graph GIS and Actinia, something I will talk about in a moment. What do we do with the point clouds? We are using a gridding approach. Uh, this we do in grass. And here it also comes to uh, what we heard before, uh, like what is relevant in HPC, how to do that for large areas. Because you can imagine you have millions of points or even more, and then you want to do some uh, gridding, which means you statistically analyze the points falling into one pixel. And you will say, for example, like here, one pixel is one meter of one meter size. So a number of pixels fall into, they are in 3D, uh, sorry, of points, laser scan points, they fall into this uh, area and then you can say, show me only the minimum, the maximum or some other univariate statistics. And if we go for maximum with some filtering, we get a kind of surface description. So you can easily recognize the houses here, uh, but also trees and so on. Um, yeah, this is absolute uh, height above sea level and then we create a normalized surface model by uh, subtracting the elevation model, the ground. So we have only the relative differences there. So even with simple thresholding, of course you can do more fancy stuff if you want, uh, maybe use classification, machine learning based, you can rather easily by combining this uh, surface model with the filter, show me everything for example above two meters, and only show if it's green using the vegetation index. Remember in the autophoto we had red and infrared channels so we can easily calculate the normalized differences vegetation index. Then we can, we get all the major vegetation structure here. So kind of forest or what it is. Some trees, also trees on the street. Here you see the shadow of the, uh, of the tree but it is not taken because it's not uh, selected in the surface model. 
Uh, same thing, uh, we can use it also for thresholding in order to identify buildings. And we found some, but of course, one of the reasons is that uh, the cadastral data are usually a bit lagging behind. You find some buildings which do not exist in the official data. Maybe uh, the official sources do actually not know that the buildings are there, or they are just lagging behind. Not my job, of course, to adjust this, but for uh, this kind of analysis, we need really to know where the data are. <coughs> And you can do some tricks with uh, zonal statistic, looking at the area size and so forth. Mm. Now, uh, to identify other classes like fields and so on, that's a bit more complex because you can imagine that the flights are done in different times of the year uh, to cover this uh, area of Northern Westphalia, which is something like, I don't remember, 30, uh, th probably 35,000 square kilometers. You need a while. Yeah, you don't do that in an afternoon to scan everything with a plane. So what you have in some, um, <clears throat> in some uh, part of your area, you have probably something like early summer or what it is here, but sometimes it's even spring or autumn. So uh, the selection of a vegetation index doesn't fully work. What we did was uh, to introduce Sentinel-2 data in this process. Um, Looking at the time series, this is the inner part of the city, so the Bonner old, uh, Bonn old Town. You can see the streets here, and you can there are plenty of trees. There's the fam famous cherry blossom, uh, usually end of March in, or in April, depends on the year. And looking at one part particular position and the time series of uh, Sentinel, nonetheless it is 10 centimeter resol uh, 10 meter resolution. Uh, we can see the differences. So. Uh, going back, this is February 2018, and this is April. So you see the differences. And this accumulated over time gives you uh, an indication of if there's a kind of dynamic development of uh, uh, vegetation or not. So this is yet another parameter. Putting this into a flowchart, <coughs> the tools are here. This actinia is then the cloud stuff uh, put around grass in order to be able to process this. Uh, process data uh, in a parallelized way. All the input data coming here, some rules, I mean it's a bit more complex than what you see here, and eventually we get the surface map out of that. <coughs> so, and uh, some examples here, we use uh, machine learning. Um, we also had uh, a, to uh, a workshop this uh, Monday on grass in OBIA, object-based uh, uh, image analysis. Uh, we are using, in this case, uh, the tool that's an extension RLearnML, machine learning. You find it on GitHub. And uh, we are using, at time, the decision tree classifier in order to get these classes out. Okay, you can now say, oh, why isn't it like 40-something classes which Corinne brings us? But remember, the Corinne land cover data are not at, I think they have, uh, what was it, 20, five uh, hectares of uh, minimum mapping unit in terms of precision. Here we're talking about pixels at 10 centimeter resolution. So it's something totally different. And we have the focus on the classes we are interested in for this particular process. So you can train the stuff to do something else, but uh, for the cable things, uh, we, are, um, we are using this kind of classification. So another example, um, aerial image. You see all the co problems with shadow and whatsoever, and this we turn into this surface uh, map, and then we can assign different costs, or say it is forbidden to um, to do uh, trenching here and so forth. So using this cost surface, uh, I didn't show this now, but you can assume we uh, assign attributes to it. Uh, then we do the cost routing. Oh, sorry, we have. Um, an algorithm in GRASS which is, uh, has been available already for, let's say, 20 or more years. Uh, later today at um, 2 p.m. I will give a talk on the GRASS development, state of GRASS GS. Uh, I will also show some more tools we are using here. Um, what you then do, uh, analyze what is the cost to move from one cell to the next. And through this we get uh, optimal path uh, which you also use in different contexts, which you use here in this case for the identification of the trenches. So, overlaying the trenches we found, according to costs and other rules, there's a huge rule set there, then we 
uh, come up with this kind of map. You can see here, following the street sides, we have different options. We could either go on the left or on the right side of the street. Here are also some interruptions because it's impossible to reach from there because of some rules telling you cannot go further. And uh, these uh, rules are also a regional thing. So it means, for example, the mayor of one city says this method is allowed here and in another one it is not. And the method is probably much cheaper than the other one, so it affects your optimal routing. And that's why we have to go here and put all of this stuff together. Okay, same thing seen on the auto photo, not much different. <clears throat> and now to the clouds, uh, talking about the cloud. We had the de more detailed talk about it yesterday. We are using the open telecom cloud here, or meanwhile we also move to internal telecom cloud. Uh, it is based on OpenShift. So we are using Docker images. They are um, running in so-called pods there. And the entire idea uh, is to run infrastructure as code. You basically have everything scripted, and then from there you can launch the entire machine. And not only our part, but all the other things with SDI, with web services and whatsoever around, which I don't show here in this, uh, at this level of detail. So this is another way of getting grass into the cloud. And um, you basically have grass in a Docker, and it, you find it on Docker Hub. Grass with PDAL uh, and Python 3, it's already there, just uh, Docker pull and so on. Um, and this we deploy in this OpenShift context. So what is this Actinia now? Actinia is a REST service around uh, uh, Grass GIS, which we have been developing, especially with Zürin Gebert in the last uh, several years. What it does is it is sending uh, the commands to the Actinia nodes. You can imagine you have different nodes there, uh, like on HPC, what you realize with Slurm, for example. Uh, here we have uh, cloud nodes, and then Actinia decides to where, so who is not busy, and to send stuff there. We also have the option to order new machines automatically, meanwhile. Um, yeah. And from the user's perspective, what happens, you will have some job you want to do, could be a Python script, could be something complex, doesn't matter, it is then sent to the different nodes and all through the rest uh, stuff. The data are left in the node because probably you want to recycle them. We have ephemeral and persistent databases so we can also uh, trash the data after some, after some time if they are not scheduled for reduce and uh, so forth. So like this, Grass is the underlying engine, but we can uh, quite grow this. So some quick glance, well, uh, kind of wow effect, but don't worry. Um, only the sections. So we have external data. You remember the Sentinel stuff. It could be the auto photos whatsoever. We pump this into the analytic, analytical part. Uh, it uses GDAL, PDAL, Grass, and something else. Uh, you have the different nodes here. Uh, whatever comes out is automatically, later on, it's not complete yet, put into a geo server. We want to have some geo server grass uh, connection directly, which is not yet, uh, which is, let's say, under development. Here's all the kind of intelligence with job management. Here's the metadata block. We connect to geo network GDI through Actinia GDI. This you also find on uh, GitHub on our repository. And here's the user side. Yeah, we are also connected to the Open EO H2020 project. We are having a wrapper here. Uh, REST API already mentioned, and you can control uh, also from your local grass session. Maybe also interesting, this entire thing. You just send the commands like you did in the past uh, 35 years of grass usage to the cloud. It's FOSS, I already mentioned. Uh, on GitHub, Mundialis Actinia Core, you find that. Um, on Actinia Mundialis DA, you get tutorial uh, and some instructions, and especially the API documentation. Well, GitHub, you can imagine how it looks like. And with that, I want to come to a conclusion. Uh, essential, as already mentioned, like the famous Skylar quote, uh, your software is uh, worth nothing without data. It applies also here, as always. And say, uh, having open data policy enables us to do stuff which we couldn't do otherwise. And it's not only an advantage, of course, in this case for the German Telecom, but it's an advantage also for us because we have then the potential to develop new ideas to be able to just uh, dive into the data and do something interesting with them. 
and also to be able to handle terabytes of data in a distributed environment. Um, importantly, German Telecom is uh, supporting the, uh, the free and open software development, the giving back effect. Uh, come at 2 p.m. to learn about the improvements here, so that's why they're small. I have no time anymore here. But we have tile approach here, which is nice to distribute to different nodes, speed improvements and other things. Um, yeah, and of course some of the Actinia development has be, been supported here and uh, I, we are grateful to that and this is again available as open source. Talk to us uh, either now or in the breaks and happy to take questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marcus. Any questions? There. Uh, thanks for the interesting talk. Uh, how did you ensure that you had a fully connected network? Did you use any network uh, tools? Yes, in the background we do that. Grass comes with a network engine, so there's a complete directed graph engine included. And that is, of course, uh, one of the tools internally used in order to, uh, to enrich, not sorry, to ensure quality. So if you want a connected network, and this is one of the requirements naturally, you do not want to have isolated things, because in the optimal routing path uh, passage, you can also have small uh, pieces here and there. We are not interested in that, but we use uh, vector tools of GrassGS to then extract the connected, largest connected network from that. It's just a command in Grass. Any other questions? Could you explain some of the automatic identification of training data that you used? No, this is a next talk. Come to the next conference because <laughs> it's uh, hot stuff and uh, under development. Happy to talk in the, in, the, um, in the break. Yeah, it's too much. We do a lot of statistical analysis, so we do pre-selection and then we try to reduce it to the good candidates, to candidate selection and statistical uh, yeah, the usual statistical stuff on top, and with that uh, we do then random sampling and then we go into classification. So what it means if you have a large area like, I don't know, imagine uh, 100 by 100 uh, square kilometers and you want, you tell someone, okay, or you have to do it yourself, go digitize the best uh, training areas, it's a drop you, even if it rains outside, you just don't, don't want to do, and we have probably many fold more training, good quality training points through that rather than when going uh, manually. And everybody is always biased. So if you think, ah, this is a cool area here, maybe it is statistically not. And so that's why we try to completely automate that step. Thank you. Any other questions here? Uh, no, thanks for the interesting. Uh, sorry, you need the mic. Sure, 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 sure. Sorry. Yeah, thanks for the interesting presentation. Um, for the uh, routing of your trenches, you mentioned that you had a huge number of rules. Could you comment on how you handle this? Were you using a rules engine or was this yeah. just uh, handled by, by lots of coding? No, no, it's, uh, okay. If you look at this part here, uh, here's the metadata part. Yeah, and in this system we have, um, so yes, uh, processing chains are also managed here because they can be different. Um, in this part are uh, the rules managed, and so we can look up where we are. Yeah, it's kind of bounding box uh, uh, approach. Yeah, maybe you are in some uh, municipality and the rule set is this. The rule sets are written in JSON, and then we pick the right one and apply those rules. So we take them over here and they then apply them uh, during the processing step. And if because the important part is the, those rules may change. And if you take your uh, process change and apply them here, you do all the analytics, but you have hard-coded this stuff, then it's impossible to maintain. And uh, of course, the scope of uh, German Telecom is to have the fiber optics rollout throughout the entire country. I just forget how many municipalities we have in Germany. 45,000 or something? Okay, plenty and uh, you really want to have an automated way of managing that. Somebody has to bring up the rules at some point, they are put, treated as metadata and then 
dynamically uh, taken uh, through the uh, bounding box approach, let's say. So thank you very much, Marcus. There's no time for, for more questions, so. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.